Joint Committee on Administrative Rules taking no action on revised rules that Illinois State Police filed for the gun ban registry with that deadline set to take effect January 1st. Welcome back, Bishop on Air, on this Wednesday morning. Not doing a live show. I'm actually recording this super early in the morning just to get you guys an early morning update. Uh, but we are going to review uh, the highlights from yesterday's Joint Committee Administrative Rule process where legislators on that bipartisan JCAR committee they uh, they asked questions at least Republicans did Democrats didn't ask questions of Illinois State Police uh, attorney Suzanne Bond uh, and also of the uh, Firearm Services Bureau's chief uh, Jeffrey Hinchco uh, so we'll hear now some of the questions that were asked and uh, where exactly they uh, end up going uh, for all of the different uh, ins and outs and the confusion that there is uh, here is uh, the, some of the first questions going in uh, and about the timeline of why the rules were filed September 15th of this year, two weeks before the October 1st opening of the registration when the law passed months earlier on January 10th. Here's uh, the question from State Representative Ryan Spain and a response from Suzanne Bond. Um, was passed at the end of the 102nd General Assembly in January last year. So walk us through the steps taken throughout the year. We've, now we've arrived at the end of the year. Uh, we're coming up upon some milestone deadlines. What was the process uh, within uh, the Illinois State Police uh, as you navigated the rulemaking uh, for this topic? Well, in the beginning, we had to work with our vendor to establish the ability to collect the endorsement affidavit. So it we were not able to immediately begin drafting language for a rule until we understood exactly how that could be done and how that would work so that those procedural issues can be captured in our rule. Additionally, as you are well aware, there were some temporary restraining orders and injunctions put upon us that also um, meant that we um, were not in a position to file emergency rules until those issues had been resolved. And so by the time that those issues were resolved, um, we needed to um, exercise the authority the legislature had given us to file both emergency rules and proposed rules. Then the question was about well, who, who told you to wait? Uh, was that internal deliberations on saying, well, hey, maybe we should wait until the courts deal with all of this. Maybe we should uh, not have to file these rules right away so that the public has uh, sufficient notice on more permanent style rules. Uh, why, why wait so long? Who, who made that decision internally? Um, it was a decision made within the Illinois State Police. I do believe that we were conferring um, with your staff and with other various entities to be sure that we understood the rules um, with regard to moving forward. We also wanted to see what the outcome perhaps of some of those court matters were to, in, in the event that they would help guide us with respect to the substance of the rules. So you've got uh, the rules that were filed September 15th on an emergency basis. They go into effect immediately when rules are filed on an emergency basis. So those rules are in effect for like 150 days, and that takes you past that January 1st deadline. So the rules are emergency and somewhat in flux. State police filed second notice on December 5th, spelling out detailed changes uh, that they're making to the rules or they're proposing to make. JCAR did not act on those amended rules, meaning they're not in place yet. The emergency rules September 15th are what's in place, but what state police are trying to add on is a variety of things. And we've talked about this and we'll have to go into even more detail, but a whole bunch of definitions that are being added, like what's an assault weapon, what's ownership of uh, uh, an assault weapon under PICA. Uh, these are terms that Illinois State Police uses. Uh, so a variety of different things about, uh, you know, transferring of firearms to police. Uh, and uh, again, uh, you know, just updates and clarifications State Police took in from the public comments. Uh, but uh, Sh Suzanne Bond said there's there's a lot there that uh, uh, they could spend a lot of time on. Those were the primary issues that we were working on. I mean, there were hundreds of comments, so I'd, I, I'm not sure if I'm adequately answering your question. 
Well, we could we could likely take a very long time going through many of those changes. How about that? Absolutely. Uh, so Ryan Spain then asks about the process of, say, relinquishing or surrendering, surrendering, surrendering your firearm if your FOID card is somehow suspended. Uh, and what happens in that process, you know, people have due process. They should be able to appeal a FOID card suspension, and they can. Uh, but what happens? Like, did the state police really, you know, change the rules uh, in the second notice to spell out clearly what happens? Because, you know, if you were to transfer your firearms to just another person who had a FOID card, uh, that's able to uh, take that firearm, say it's a security officer or something like that, right? Some of those exempt classes, uh, then you can't get that back if the FOID card issue is resolved. Well, uh, Suzanne Bond uh, spelled out some of the detail on how they, uh, they rectified that in the second notice rules that are not yet in effect as we barrel towards that January 1st deadline. Well what we have tried to flesh out in the rules is that if you surrender to law enforcement, then law enforcement would hold those um, assault weapons during the pendency of any appeal that you might file. Now, you would have to tell the law enforcement agency up front that you intended to appeal, but during the pendency of that um, appeal, you, they would hold those weapons so that should you be successful, the firearm could be returned to you. And if you were not successful, then you would be able to direct that that firearm be transferred to a, an FFL for sale on your behalf to somebody who is eligible to receive it so that you don't just lose um, your asset. We had originally indicated that you would need to make that notification to law enforcement within 180 days, which is four times the amount of time that is afforded to the FOID card review board to action their appeal. Um, but based upon questions that we received, I believe that we are attempting to work toward language that would allow you to simply update law enforcement every 30 days so that you could, um, so that law enforcement would retain that weapon for the entire, until your appeal is exhausted. Would that be a subsequent rulemaking that we would see at a later time or is there a requirement for that? I, I, could you accomplish that administratively? I think that we're trying to work out an agreed upon um, a, a, an agreed upon amendment to the rule during second notice. So again, uh, just to highlight that uh, these second notice rules are not finalized. The rules in general are not finalized as we barrel towards that January 1st deadline for people to register their firearms with state police, their banned firearms. They have to tell state police they owned banned items. Uh, that, uh, that's coming up January 1st with criminal penalties. Uh, but remember, I mean, there were court cases, and there's still court cases, and some of those court cases early on resulted in temporary restraining orders against the state from enforcing the law. And uh, people went out and purchased firearms. Uh, what's been contemplated in the rules when it comes to that particular issue? When the courts terminated those TROs or re removed those injunctions, they did not take any action to direct the to direct the state police that those purchases were um, lawful and that those weapons could be retained. We don't believe that that is a question that is up for us to decide. We believe that um, the prosecuting authorities throughout the state of Illinois could ultimately decide that those weapons are not lawfully possessed, and so we don't believe that we can within rule, that we have the authority within rule to say otherwise. We have established our endorsement portal to allow for people to submit endorsement affidavits for those purchases so that if they may lawfully retain them, that we have not taken any action to prohibit that. But absent that, we haven't been able to find any um, additional authority that lets us further resolve that issue. So the statute actually requires that you attest that you possessed it prior to January 10th. Um, but our system and the way that it is set up um, will allow you to put a date after January 10th. And then there were uh, questions about the uh, 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 process, the program, the web browser uh, ability for people to file these affidavits. How's it working out? From the Firearm Services Bureau, uh, Jeffrey Hinchko was there uh, to discuss uh, the feedback they're getting from people who are filing these affidavits online. It's working pretty well overall. Uh, there's 
obviously some uh, feedback that we've received, such as make models that may or may not have been uh, originally available, uh, that we have since provided guidance uh, through uh, emails or, or communication via phone of, of how to register or endorse those correctly uh, with using uh, either other or uh, utilizing what the weapon or the firearm was originally intended and designed as. So uh, then Ryan Spain went into um, all the feedback he's getting, uh, people concerned about how the site might not be operating, how maybe it should be, uh, and even a specific question that Spain got from a constituent right as he was heading into the meeting. Just coming in this morning, I received a call from someone who is attempting to register uh, an autoloader shotgun but the uh, available gauges did not match up with with his firearm. So, you know, and this is on December 12th, while we have many people will be waiting, presumably to make some decisions either based on what happens in court or getting to the end of the year here. So what what guidance do we have for some of the issues we may run into within the portal, especially when we're getting into a crunch of a lot of traffic uh, all at one time over a holiday period. So if, if, if it's identified that they're unable to locate a specific gauge or ammunition or something along those lines and unable to complete the endorsement affidavit uh, correctly and efficiently, then we would highly recommend that they reach out to us whether it's via phone or email um, or visit one of our local kiosks in, in order to establish that so we can be fully aware of that issue and make the correction. So there's only four kiosks across the state. I don't think there's one in Chicago, uh, at least that I, I didn't see one in Chicago listed. Uh, but regardless, uh, you've got the questions about the uh, the overall program and how it's operating. Is it operating sufficiently? Uh, are people going to find themselves entering the wrong type of information? And then who knows, maybe somebody down the line sees that they have a different type of firearm. Are they going to be charged with lying on that uh, affidavit? How is that going to be handled by prosecutors? Uh, what about the confusion there is uh, just with even, you know, police agencies? How are they going to deal with all of this? Uh, but ultimately, uh, they did talk about the, the volume of people who have registered and just to reiterate where we're at with that registration process and the numbers that were updated last week 6,100 individuals have filed I'm assuming that's probably a little bit more now because these numbers are a few days old but uh, only uh, 6,100 people of 2.4 million void card holders in the state of Illinois uh, so about that uh, you know overall volume of those who are registering uh, that question was also asked, but specifically the question was asked, what happens to that data if indeed the courts find that this law is unconstitutional? Uh, if this act is found to be unconstitutional, what happens with the data that the 20,000 data points that have now been collected by the state police? I believe we will be looking to the court to guide us on what they want us to do with that information. I, we would hope that that wouldn't have to come from the legislature. We would hope that in in deciding this litigation, the courts would um, direct the state police on what to do with that data. And, and what if they don't? What will be the uh, data custody arrangement for the state police? I think we will be conferring with our legal counsel regarding what their recommendation would be. I think that's a really critical issue that I'd encourage you to have that um, conferral uh, immediately as soon as possible. Uh, we need to understand, you know, many constituents that have reached out have a lot of questions about the, the data privacy, um, the database concerns that have been assembled here. And so, uh, listen, I certainly hope that there is clear direction from the courts, uh, but there may not be, or there may be conflicting direction from the courts, as we've seen on this topic uh, so far. I do want to uh, kind of pause here and, and just highlight a story from Illinois State Police reporting that there was a, uh, a hack of the firearm owner identification card portal. 
back in 2021, and uh, they reported then uh, that uh, there were uh, more than 2,000 FOID card holders who's had their information possibly compromised. Uh, so this clearly was uh, something that is, is alarming uh, because uh, this is information about people who own firearms. And if you've got a database out there of addresses of all the people who own firearms somehow leaking, I mean, imagine uh, how that could be used by a criminal to then go out and uh, try to, you know, uh, burglarize somebody and steal those firearms. Uh, same question goes for people registering, quote, assault weapons with state police. What happens to the security of that data? Uh, that's personal information that uh, could, in the wrong hands, lead to some uh, uh, severe consequences. Uh, but um, you know, what's fascinating also is the registration and the affidavits. Who has access to that? You know, there's a concern about you know, possible hacks, obviously. But uh, what about law enforcement across the state, not just state police? How are they going to be able to access this information? And how is that information going to be used by local law enforcement agencies? Typically, a law enforcement officer stops a, um, a motorist and takes their driver's license and runs it through leads. It will provide obviously the name, date of birth, address, uh, if there's any criminal history, things of that nature. And LEADS is the Law Enforcement um, Access to Data System. All right, so L-E-A-D-S. It's an Illinois system. Uh, more from Hinchco. So when a law enforcement officer uh, has an, an encounter with uh, somebody within LEADS and runs them, it will come back as far as a PICA endorsement affidavit, yes or no. So that's in the lead system. Uh, Spain asks where that's at in the law. And is that uh, allowed that this is plugged into the lead system? Was the inclusion of endorsement affidavits in leads part of the Protect Illinois Communities Act? Are you asking whether it's statutorily required that we make that information available through leads? Correct. No, I do not believe it is. So this direction was not included within the act. Uh, what statutory authority does the state police have to take this data for 6,000 individuals and counting and place it within the lead system? I will have to get back to you on that. So more from Ryan Spain. Uh, he has uh, continued questions about this, uh, especially you know the the question of uh, law and uh, whether that that's in there, and just overall uh, where we're at in this process of the rules being filed, revisions of those rules being filed. And so the purpose of entering that information into leads, while I can't tell you what our statutory authority, statutory authority for doing it, I can tell you the purpose and why we did it. Um, so if you encounter, if a law enforcement officer encounters a person who is in possession of an assault weapon, the only way they're gonna know whether or not that person is lawfully in possession of that is is if they will know that an endorsement affidavit has been completed or they're um, subject to some type of exemption. The most common exemption will of course be the endorsement affidavit. So they have to have a way to see whether that's been completed or not. And the way that we elected to communicate that to law enforcement is through leads. So they will, so if I were to be pulled over, they would get my name, date of birth, address, all of that stuff, my criminal history, they would know whether I had a FOID card, they would know whether I had a CCL and whether I had completed an endorsement affidavit and therefore could lawfully possess the weapon that I'm in possession of. But yet you have no statutory authority to place that information within leads or no administrative authority to do so. Is I'm that not, correct? I'm not conceding that we don't have any statutory authority. I'm, I just don't want to cite incorrectly for you our authority. I mean, just like we play, I, I can't tell you what our statutory authority for entering the FOID card information into leads is. I, I don't have the appropriate citation for you. I apologize for that, but I do believe we have statutory authority. So uh, clearly well, there's uh, some, some questions still about uh, the statutory authority when it comes to leads. Uh, more from uh, yesterday's JCAR meeting on the second notice rules from Illinois State Police. I, I just, for the life of me, can't understand why we would want to be placing red flags among the law-abiding citizens who are completing this endorsement affidavit process and having that information 
and the data concerns that we've already discussed presented in leads without any statutory authority to do so. So um, just a point of clarification, it's not an indication of a red flag. So just like if you have a FOID card, that information is in leads to protect the person so that the officer is aware that they can lawfully possess weapons. The, this, the intent behind the endorsement affidavit designation in leads serves the same purpose. It's to let the law enforcement officer know that the person is in compliance and may lawfully possess. It's not to it's not the same as an indicator of criminal history or gang affiliation or those types of entries. It's to let the law enforcement officer know that the person is in compliance with the law. That's interesting uh, question of whether or not, you know, that's there's like a red flag. Uh, they have not uh, you know, uh, filed an affidavit, but they are a FOID card holder. Would that lead to some further uh, investigation? If you get pulled over and the uh, police run your license and they, they see, oh, you're a FOID card holder, but you haven't, uh, provided an affidavit that you own a quote assault weapon uh, could that say lead to the officer wanting to search your vehicle uh, so uh, there, there's a lot of you know interesting pitfalls that are going to be present in this if indeed this thing is uh, enforced moving forward uh, state representative uh, Stephen Reich had a question about what if he's pulled over and indeed uh, you know the, there's visibly a firearm a semi-automatic firearm in the back seat while the individual's driving and that individual has not filed an affidavit what happens to that individual on an unrelated uh, on an unrelated type of stop I'm not talking about me going and using that gun in a, in a crime. I'm talking about it just laying in the back of my car and I had a taillight out and that's why I was stopped. If you're in possession of an assault weapon and there is no applicable exemption, meaning you're not statutorily exempt and you haven't filed the endorsement affidavit and the traffic stop occurs after January 1st, I think that um, you potentially could be charged with um, possession unlawful possession under the UUW statute, and that's, I believe the first offense is a misdemeanor. I believe it's a class A misdemeanor, I believe. Yes, it's a class A misdemeanor, second offense, class three felony. Uh, so obviously uh, some serious consequences there. You could lose your rights to vote uh, if that's the case. Uh, but again, you know, while you know if it's visible there and the police officer sees it in a traffic stop and then sees that you haven't filed an affidavit, then okay, there's one step. But what if it's not visible? Uh, there's no indication of it, but uh, police run and see that you have a FOID card. Then they go further and they see you have not filed an affidavit. Uh, is that enough to trigger possibly a search uh, to see, well, it says you haven't filed an affidavit. Uh, you mind if we uh, take a look around your vehicle to see if you've got one? Uh, here's Ryan Spain asking a question that uh, is just to make it clear as to what exactly would be a violation. Okay, so it's not, I, I'm sorry if I said that I misspoke. It's not for failure to complete the endorsement affidavit. You can't be charged with failure to complete an endorsement affidavit. If you are in possession. Right and you don't have the endorsement affidavit, the charge would be for the possession. Of okay, the so that, I understand that. Okay. And then as a follow-up, what consequences, if any, would there be for an individual's FOID card if they were found in possession of a prohibited firearm without an endorsement affidavit? So I believe, I think I just looked this up the other day, but I believe that the only section within the FOID Act, the FOID Act um, prohibitors are found within Section 8 of the Act. I believe the only Section 8 prohibitor is for filing false information within an endorsement affidavit. I don't believe that there is any specific grounds within Section 8 for revocation um, simply because you didn't do it. I, I believe that's correct. Could you, so uh, you know, misdemeanor uh, can't lead to somebody getting a, uh, uh, a criminal chart or a, a, a suspension of the FOID card, but a felony could, uh, the second offense. Uh, so interesting to hear all of that. Uh, Ryan Spain wrapping up yesterday's JCAR meeting, uh, at least focused on the Illinois State Police portion of it, uh, talking where they're at in this process. And so at this time, I would announce that uh, this proposed permanent rulemaking uh, will be removed from the certification of no ob objection. That means the rules will not be adopted today and then would appear again uh, on the January uh, meeting for JCAR. And Kevin, that date is January 16th, a meeting that will take place in Springfield. 
So we'll uh, revisit all of this again on January 16th at uh, the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules meeting here in Springfield. Uh, clearly, we'll be on the floor, uh, on the ground, uh, running around trying to get more answers because while the emergency rules filed September 15th are the only rules that are in place right now, not the revised rules that Illinois State Police have uh, put forward. So uh, here we are in this process uh, continuing to play out. Uh, as uh, the rules are not fully in place. They're only emergency rules uh, in place right now. So uh, clearly, uh, there's going to be a lot more to be said about all of this uh, as we rapidly approach that January 1st deadline. Uh, or else, you know, if you don't file those affidavits with state police, uh, you could be found uh, uh, with a charge of uh, Class A misdemeanor or a Class 3 felony. Uh, so that's the highlights of uh, yesterday's Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. Bit of a long segment here, but I think it's important you guys understand uh, where we're at in all of that process. All right, it's Bishop on air. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, follow along, like, subscribe. Hit that notification bell. And uh, also, if you're on X, be sure to find me, Bishop on Air, Bishop on Air, because if you, uh, you know, find me there, you can stay up to date even more real time, especially when I'm inside of a federal courtroom uh, tweeting out what's uh, being said. Uh, so we'll uh, get to some of that next. All right. So be sure to check out the other segments here with Bishop on Air.